Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to reinvent yourself and discover who you truly are, then we have the Rebirth Show for you. Today, I'll be talking with Kamal Ravakant, a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, the best-selling author of one of my all-time favorite books, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It, and the author of a fantastic new fable on life, Rebirth. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about walking the El Camino and love, forgiveness, and following your heart. That plus we'll talk about bookending the day, forgiveness in med school, what in the world's the cat shuffle, what heart, dream, and stone have to do with one another, the importance of switching from why now to now what, and what in the world hopping fences in Pescadero has to do with anything. <laughs> gotcha. You've done your homework. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> welcome back to the show, Kamal. Are you ready to shine? I am. I'm so thrilled to be here, man. Like, like we were talking before, I was in your first show. You and were. Now, and now you're on number 600 something, which just, man, kudos to you. You know, it's, you know, one thing I've learned in life at Silicon Valley is the, the key to success is persistence. You know, caring about something and persisting at it. And you're, you're doing it, man. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. And without picking on my thoughts too much, I've, I've cut back on the neurosis. We were a seven day a week show for a oh, good, good 550 episodes. And now we're, now we're down to a svelte five day a week show. Well, it's you know, good to take <laughs> vacations. <laughs> Every now and again, we don't we don't want to go too easy, though. You're doing your own startup with this show, exactly, and that's how I'm viewing it. Is it takes a lot of fuel to get you into orbit? Yeah, yeah. I have this personal philosophy: activation energy. You know, it's like um, it's, it's it's. But look, if any time we wait around to want to do something that matters, we'll never do it. We actually have to put in the activation energy, the work, the emotional effort. And then eventually you hit that point where you like go through the clouds and then it's just like kind of on its own and it's going, you know, it's like anything in life, like creating a show, writing a book, building a company, going to the gym, changing your health, you know, loving someone, you know, whatever, you know, like, um, it's, it's a very core, simple concept, but that, I think it's a fundamental concept in life. I like it. Activation energy, putting in the energy now to get to get it to a place of, if not cruise control, but a place where you can take a deep breath or two. Yeah, it's a concept of chemistry. You know, like I took uh, two years of chemistry in college, you know, mm -hmm. organic and organic. And I remember that activation is you have this compound and you're trying to get a chemical reaction. Now, keep in mind, I'm remembering this from a while back. And it's like you add energy, but to a certain point and then boom. That's that point of the activation and it, and it connect and it hits and the and the and the reaction happens. You know, that's activation energy. I like it. So let's let's segue from activation energy, and I want to go back in time a little bit. And I'm wondering if you can give us kind of the abridged version, Kamal 101, or the story that led you to your book, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends on It. Sure. Uh, I mean, the basic, the brief thing is, you know, I'm a Silicon Valley guy. I've been doing startups uh, since the first dot-com boom. Uh, before that, I was doing clinical research. And before that, I was in the Army. I was an infantry soldier in the U.S. Army. I was, you know, um, you know, immigrant child. We came here when I was a little kid. And uh, no money. My mom raised my brother and I in a single mom. And, uh, you know, taught us the power of just persistence, actually, if you think about it, by being an example. And, uh, and so Silicon Valley, and then you know, I've had successes and failures, which is part of the game. And then my last company that I built, and this is, a little, this is going back now a few years, um, you know, I put all my eggs in it because I was all in, you know, the seven day thing forever, and mm -hmm. it was doing really well. And, um, and then after f like three and a half years, it just bl it blew up. And, you know, I was a CEO, uh, you know, the, the, all the responsibilities on my shoulders, but I kind of blew up with it. And so much of my ego and my life and my finances and my sense of being was all wrapped up in it. When it blew up, I blew up. And I was incredibly sick and depressed. And depressed would have been a good day. And um, one morning, I was locked up at home, like just, just miserable. And one morning, I woke up. And I was like, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to get out of this and die trying. And I... I literally staggered over to my, because I had no energy, I staggered over to my, my desk and a journal where I would just keep notes, and I wrote a vow to myself. And I don't know where it came from, but I wrote a vow to myself that I was going to love myself. 
and I don't know where that came from either, but it just did. And that moment of just sheer, I'm, I got to save myself. Mm-hmm. And then when I wrote that vow, I'm like, well, I'm a big believer in if you make a vow to yourself, you keep it. You know, that's where transformation happens, right? It's like you burn the bo- boats behind you. You don't even burn them, you, they explode. Behind <laughs> you. There's no going back, right? Yeah. So it's like, well, okay, what do I do? I had no idea. And, you know, like, I don't like cliches and there's too much about, there was too much about that online and in books, you know. If any of those had really worked, we would all be fine, right? So, like, I didn't even do that. I just started working in my head. And that came from the old clinical research background. I just started writing studies in my head of, like, feeling certain ways and doing certain things and repeating certain things, just obsessively locked in my apartment, just doing this. And noticing what would shift my mental state and what did, I would go deeper. If it didn't shift, I wouldn't go. I would throw it aside. I had like no, there was no sacred cows, right? It was just purely an effort to save myself. And eventually, like the things that worked, they went deeper. And some, if they stopped working that deep, I cut mm-hmm. them out. Like what's going, I want to go all the way down. And eventually I realized, you know, what, what shifted for me was certain key, fundamental key, simple things done consistently, you know, creating that activation energy. And like, my insights started to shift. I got better. And what was interesting, my life got better. And all I did was work on the inner self. And is, the, is there one key element? You said there are a bunch of them. Is there one that you can share with people that you started doing as a repeated habit and doing and doing and doing? I mean, look, I can and I'm happy to. But what I found is the whole, the, what I, what I, it was like three or four things I ended up doing. And it was a practice. And it, they just really fit perfectly a compound. So what I found actually with the book, and I need to update it with that, is sometimes a lot of people will just do one thing. That mm-hmm. seems easiest for them, which is fine to start. But to get the real magic, they just all work together. So that's why I like kind of like pull back on just sharing one or two things. And even if I explain the whole thing, it'll be like, oh. Versus in the book, um, I wrote in a way that it gets layered inside the person that I can't help but try. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, but it was all just inner stuff. Nothing, no rocket science, no... You know, I, I mean, I've look, I'm, uh, I have a degree in biology economics, so I know, you know, I have a fascination with neuroscience. So I kind of like knew what I, what I took about neuroscience, mm-hmm. the knowledge I had, and just started. But, you know, knowledge without application is just, you know, mental masturbation, right? <laughs> Am I allowed to say that here? <laughs> yeah, yeah you're, you're allowed to say that. And it's, it's why at the end of the show, I'm going to ask you for a homework assignment to give people. Because people, if they listen to podcast after podcast after yeah, podcast, and they don't yeah. actually do do anything i would love to help with that because i'm a big you know i give talks and they do very well and i'm a big believer in not like preparing for them but going and feeling the audience from the heart by giving them throughout the whole talk just one thing mm-hmm. that they take away because i've been to too many talks man where so rehearsed so well prepared so inspiring Rara. but if you find the audience a week later how's your life changed they'll be like huh Right? Then what are you doing? You know, you, you just, you know, just might as well just go watch, watch a movie, you know, go, go have fun. Uh, so I would be happy to do that. So, but I have uh, the one key thing mm-hmm. is basically what you're doing, consistency. It's it, that, that what I learned. I was, the metaphor I used was, it's like going to the gym. You want to get in shape. You go to the gym consistently. It's not like you go to the gym for one day or two days or five days this month, I say, okay, you know, I went to the gym. I'm not in perfect shape. Oh, well, it didn't work for me. Well, no. And also, if you go to the gym, get in great shape, and then you don't go for four years and eat donuts every day for your, for your diet, what's going to happen? Same thing. I think fundamentally the core things that matter, mm-hmm. which is what I learned, which actually I think is one of the things that when I put this book out, I really wanted to, you know, and the other things that I've come across afterwards – I don't think people make the the argument or the you know the point that consistency is the key to all of this. Consistently working, you know. So what I didn't just come up with this practice. It was like me doing consistently, obsessively. And you know, look, when I do it obsessively in my life, my life just zings, and I get lazy, and then then I don't, and my life stops zinging. And it's like, hey, okay, start zinging again. It's really that simple, and it's a very small price to pay for our fundamental, for our expression to the world, for our personal freedom, for feeling, I mean, look, feeling love for ourselves, you know, like to be, to be able to play, be in a place where that naturally comes, what a small price to pay, you know? Yeah. 
it, it's, it's something I've said about my coaching for a very long time, which is, and, and I'm always particular who I take on as coaching clients because I say you can lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. If somebody's not wanting to do the work, there's no amount of help that you can give them that will get you there. How do you light a fire under somebody's belly to get them to do this day in and day out? Is there a way? Um, one, be an example. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a old thing, you know, like you can't change anybody of the world without changing yourself. You know, and when you change, when you're an example, and look, I, I fail miserably daily. I'm very open. I don't coach anybody or anything. I'm just um, like, I'm going to put up my hand too. That's how I learned. <laughs> yeah. And look, I will consistently, I plan to consistently fail every day for the rest of my life, but that's okay. But I'm working at it. Mm -hmm. Right? And the parts that work to just keep me going forward. And so I would say it's one, be an example. Mm -hmm. And then two is share what you did that got you there. And then ultimately people, certain people will be at a place in their life where they're ready to try that. Mm -hmm. And also, but one thing I also do is the way I write my books. Uh, what most people that know is, you know, that people assume well, I just sat down and banged out this book in a weekend or whatever. I spent a decade and a half obsessively writing and rewriting and studying the great writers. No, that was like Hemingway that you were writing and yeah, rewriting, right? Yeah, like studying the great, sending in, you know, manuscripts, getting rejection letters, but always like trying to be a better writer. But that got me to the point where I could write a book that simple, that true, right? So, so that's the other next thing to write to use our talents in such a way that that can express the fundamental truths of what we are, what we've done, that it can't help but shift other people and make them want to do it, right? Um, that's the next thing. And I think that's all it is. Be an example and share in a way that only you can, whatever your thing is. For me, it's writing. Like, look, if I never got published, mm -hmm. I still would be writing till the day I died because that is my thing. That is such a key lesson for people that if you're doing it without attachment to it needs to be a New York Times bestseller, I need to make a million dollars, da, 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 da. but if instead that's your thing and you do it, you're going to be a quote unquote success to yourself. Quote unquote overnight success too, it just takes a decade. <laughs> 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 you know, but that's something I learned too, like all these, you know, people get caught up in so-and-so is killing it, killing it. The people, like, let's just look at Silicon Valley, right? Mm -hmm. The entrepreneur, first-time entrepreneurs who head out of the park, so rare. It's such a tiny fraction of a fraction of a fraction of 1%. You know, the real ones are the ones who have actually, like, were working at it for a while and worked for a different startup and learned and, like, probably started one and failed and learned from there and then went on and did their thing. You know, but they, they love the love the whole love technology, love building things. They have to do it. You know, like um, you know, there's a great interview with the founder of Instagram, Kevin Storm. Um, mm -hmm. He used to sit a few desks away from me when he started Instagram. You know, and and but he had gone to like some other startup that didn't work. Then he went to Google because he wanted to be around the smartest people there. And then he went and built this startup called Bourbon, which was failing. And then decided to strip out everything in that product that was failing and just left in one thing was photos and filters that became Instagram and immediately took off. It's quote unquote instant success. People don't know that side of the story, but that's really important. It's the process, not getting a little lost and well, um, well, I tried once, I failed. It's like saying you go to the gym once, I didn't get in shape. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I did free throws once. I'm not any good at it. Yeah, yeah. But finding our thing, you know, and you ever watch this movie? It was in the 80s. It was called City Slickers. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, the one who's, uh, thing. Billy, Billy Crystal. Yeah. And who was the, uh, what's the name of that actor? Um, but he goes, you got to find your one thing. And he goes, the other guy goes, what is it? You got to find yours yourself. That is our job. You know, but we all know. It's like, what what is that we can do when we're doing it, when we're in it? Like, time stops or we don't care or we feel better for having done it. That we do on our own. That's basically the way to our one thing. It's really simple, you know. And then if you can use that to share our fundamental truths that we learn in life, that's magic. Where does fear fit into mm -hmm. our one thing? Oh, fear. Well, look, the only thing we're hard, only fears we're hardwired for is what? Fear of loud, loud noises and what heights or something like that. There's only two fears that we actually hardwired for the rest is all just an illusion and uh funny enough i think the closer we get to success where one thing the greater the fear is 
because we have to put ourselves out there. Mm-hmm. Look, I was terrified of putting Love Yourself out. I, was ter- I came so close not to. I, and then I put it out and I hid it underneath the desk. And within a month, it was the number one self-help book on Amazon. And it's gone on to, dude, I don't know how many copies it sold, but like all the emails I get from people's lives has changed. And look, my fear would have stopped me from that. My fear, and what was the fear? It was fear that I would look like a fool, I'd be humiliated, maybe I'd destroy my career in Silicon Valley. It was all fears of the self, you know, versus I literally, like I stood nothing to gain at that point by writing that book. It was purely just to share Mm -hmm. something that had worked for me. I didn't know if it was going to work for other people. It seemed to help friends, I told, but the general public, random person browsing Amazon, who knows, right? But the fear is all about the self, and that's just our ego trying to like, uh, save itself, and and the uh, I think the irony is that there is nothing to save. That's all an illusion anyway. The true self exists when we put ourselves out to the world. Amen. Yeah. There's a there's a, a theme that you've you've mentioned several times, probably in our last interview um, in the book that we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. But it's such a powerful theme that I think of whenever I hear anything close to it. I think of you, which is oh. to jump off the cliff and grow our wings on the way down. Yeah. You know, it, it actually, when I first moved to Silicon Valley, you know, I, I was in between careers. I was writing, but I was not, you know, getting any, I was a shitty writer. I was just writing, you know, and I thought I knew what I was doing until I started reading Hemingway, Hemingway. I realized I knew nothing. And Silicon Valley was booming, and I was talking to a friend of mine, uh, Larry Rappaport. I still remember mm-hmm. it. We were upstate New York at Gold's Gym working out, and I was telling him, like, I was going to move. I was thinking I moved to Silicon Valley, and, and, but I was scared. And he said, come on, leap, and the net will appear. And I remember when he said that, I thought about it. I was like, okay, I'll do it. Sold everything, got a one-way ticket, went, right? Um, and the net does appear. But what I've learned more than that, forget the net. It's like when we leap uh, our, for our true selves, like mm-hmm. I did with Love Yourself, you know, like put, w- our wings pop out. That's when our wings pop out. Like we stand at the edge of the cliff thinking, when it's safe, when – X happens, when Y happens, and then I'll do this. Actually, the irony is it'll never happen. you got to jump, and down the way is when that, when that happens. You're in motion. I think life is motion. When we're when we just um, – Tim Ferriss gave me this great advice once. He said, you know, like I asked him once how he got through something really hard, and he said he realized he couldn't think his way out of it. He said, because we, we can't think our way out of things. It's, you got to be. you got to be in motion. you got to do. Take action. Because when you're action, then at least there's possibilities and paths and you know to go down. Um, and that's where you learn and everything you need to do to actually do well, like, you know, at whatever you're the path you've taken. Um, but you won't get that by thinking your way through it. Right? Because the mind is just gonna project movies based on fear. Mm-hmm. Right? It's not gonna the mind does not serve us. It helps you cross the street. Sometimes. <laughs> 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 but the mind does not tell us what the right street to cross is. The heart is. It's intuition. It's your um, gut. It's it's us feeling that that is the right thing for me. And then fear pops up. And that's a signal. Go there. The mind will say, go down the other street. It's safer. I love what you're saying. Cause, and, and that's a challenge that we try to address all the time on the show is helping people get from here, get from the head, get to the heart. And what you're saying is so true. When you see the fear, when you feel the fear, that is exactly where you probably need to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, if there's a burning building, you know, and no, fear says get there. out, get out, you know, like that's, that's legit, right? Or you're like, you don't need to go there if there's no one in there you, need to, you want to save. But it's like, other, but outside of that, man, there, it's like fear is a signal. And I think we've just turned, we've just turned it around and look at it the wrong way. Fear signal is saying go there, where we actually think it's saying go away. I don't know why we do that, but actually I think it's a great signal. We actually, it's, it's a positive thing in life. We just don't, for some reason, as human beings, listen, have have just interpreted the data wrong. I call it fear and anxiety is excitement without action. As soon as you take action, fear and anxiety is excitement without action. That's, that's powerful. I like that a lot. Yeah. It transforms. It transforms. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let's go from there. And I want to dive into your book in just a minute. Before I do that, what has, what has changed or evolved or has there been any big shift in understanding that you've g- gained over the last few years between these books? Oh, yeah, lots. Lots, which is what I, why I wrote this book. 
well, one of the reasons, I, uh, one of the many reasons I wrote this book, but I wanted to layer those in into the new book. You know, I don't just want to write the same book over and over again. You know, I'm also a writer, and I want to share in a new and different way. And also, as a writer, I've learned there's there's ways to share different ways of sharing knowledge that layer into the person, but people. Like, for example, forgiveness, which is a big theme of rebirth, where I realize that loving yourself, forgive, self-forgiveness is a huge part of it, mm-hmm. but the book doesn't cover it, right? That's one thing I've learned. And so that's a very important one. In fact, I almost think if I was to expand the book, and I'm, I'm actually working on doing it, you know, because with the things I've learned, um, self-forgiveness will be the first part of the practice. And it's a, and a very, pra- not saying, hey, go forgive yourself. And everyone's like, yeah, go fuck yourself. Like, how do you got to do, sorry. <laughs> but it's like, how are you going to do it, right? Like, I, I look, I'm, I'm from Silicon Valley. So I care about practical stuff that works. I don't like getting lost in the ether without, just for the sake of getting lost in the ether. You know, mm-hmm. like, at, at least if I'm going to share it. So like, just stuff I do that's been very transformative for me. But I think self-forgiveness is the best way to start uh, for self-love. Is there so that's such, been a huge, huge learning. Is there such a thing as, as how do I put this? I can hear people saying, uh, I don't deserve to be forgiven. Um, that's the same people who say, I don't deserve to love myself. But, you know, like, listen, that's all. It's like someone, a couple of people ask me, like, is self, is self-love sounds narcissistic. Ironically, those are all kind of like overeducated individuals, like overly like multiple PhDs, people in the head, right? And what I think is like, look, true narcissism is hating yourself. Mm-hmm. True narcissism is, is not forgiving. So it's, a fo- it's such an obsessive focus on the self, thinking that, that who we were really matters. Like, no, who we are going to be, who we're becoming is what matters. But to start that, you got to wipe the slate clean. Right, and forgiveness does that, and we owe it to ourselves to wipe our slates clean because otherwise we will just be living the past. Woo! Perfect segue takes us to your beautiful book, which is a fable, which I've got to, I've got to believe is much, much harder to write. Um, it's called Rebirth, mm-hmm. and you're talking about wiping the slate clean. So why call it Rebirth? Well, actually, originally the the book was called A Thin Place, which mm-hmm. is a concept uh, that concept uh, I refer to it in the book, uh, uh, which is about as this uh, this Episcopal minister told me when I was uh, walking the Camino de Santiago in Spain that there's a place in, in on on Earth where you can almost feel like the presence, the, like a thin line between heaven and earth. You can almost mm-hmm. feel the presence, you know, something special, presence on the other side. So that's what it was called. But but my agent and also the publisher felt that. It was too literary. And so I thought about it. And ultimately, as I started, sat down to write this book last year, what I had sold, I just, I rewrote it. Like I just ripped out everything, just left the scaffolding and then wrote what I've learned, you know, so much in my life, including that since Love Yourself, including Love Yourself. Um, that I realized this, on the, uh, fundamentally, this is a book of personal transformation. Mm-hmm. The, a, a one, one man's journey of personal transformation and in there, the lessons layered in of how he achieves it, which the, which, which the reader learns along the way as well, and which is fundamentally rebirth. And also, because it takes place on this ancient pilgrimage in Spain called the Camino de Santiago, which is 550 miles long from northeast Spain all the way to northwest Spain, um, someone along the way, when I was walking, it told me that the Camino is broken into three segments, life, death, rebirth. And so it just, it all fit. It just fit perfectly. And it really was when I came. When I realized it was rebirth, I was like, "Yeah, that's the title. That is this book is re- about not just the character's rebirth, but the rebirth of anyone who reads it, and maybe even rebirth of the author." Yes, and <laughs> <laughs> funny how that works, right? It is. So, what was it like? I want to dive into the book specifically, and I, I've got approximately ten different uh, uh, questions to ask you, or different different um, things that we can glean from it. Everybody, you're going to want to get this book. This is one of the few books, fables that I've read that is a page burner that keeps your attention from page number one. It keeps you through to the end, and then and then you're going uh, afterwards. Ah, oh, crap! I want to walk it myself. So, which means you've done your job. Yeah. So yeah. what what is the energy like being on on the Camino and so many people have traveled this path before? It it feels to me, my guess is that it's almost imprinted something into the journey. 
Yeah, I mean, look, it's been around since the 11th century. Millions and millions of people walked it, right? And they all, all the way from kings to paupers, you name it, all across Europe, came from all over Europe and walked it. And so you can't do something like that and just be part of something special. And I'm not religious in any way. Like, I, it was something that I kind of stumbled upon accidentally and ended up walking it. But, you know, things like that, pilgrimages, they exist in different cultures for a reason. They do transform you because you you become part of something bigger than yourself. Yet you're still yourself, and you, you and the kind of pe- and you the kind of people who come to walk a pilgrimage are not your average Joe Schmo either, right? So you meet very interesting people and share with each other stories of your lives. You learn from each other, and a consistent. It's also a momentum. It's a forward journey. Every mm-hmm. day you just get like the mayor Santiago. Every morning you get up, you have a cafe con leche, put on your backpack, and walk west, and then you know. You, you walk and then you get somewhere and you, you go through mountains, you go through vineyards, you go through cities, you go through ruined castles. I mean, just like imagine, you know, Spain, wilderness in Spain, and then walk into wheat fields for days and then walk, you know, like through desert. It's, it's amazing. It's, uh, it, it does change you. No one I've ever met who's done has come back the same. And it is interesting you say that it makes you want to walk because that is consistent, I've found, from like... Some everyone who's read it says, "Okay, I'm making my plans." So I was like, "Okay, I did something special there." You know, I didn't set out to convince people to ride, walk the Camino Santiago, mm-hmm. but I think if I've shared the magic that happens in the journey, people want to go experience it with themselves. That makes sense. So, how much does the book mirror real life? The first draft was a memoir. Mm-hmm. Uh, this last draft was basically this very bare scaffolding of the memoir. So I would say it's. Maybe twenty five percent real life. Mm-hmm. The rest is all fiction. And is there a a real life standout moment that didn't make it into the book? Oh, there's many. There's many. Uh, and writing, I mean, this amazing stuff I cut, man. But that's the writing a story, man. You cut out anything that doesn't mm-hmm. serve the story because a story needs forward momentum. You can't, right? Sorry, yeah. No, no. What's one of those things that you weren't able to put in? That was that was stands out to you? Actually, the true things that matter, I fit them in. Uh, in the true lessons that matter, I fit them in. But there were some great stories to illustrate those that I had to cut out. Because the stories uh, cut down the momentum. and didn't serve the momentum. Mm-hmm. And um, like a lot of, like Kat, that parrot character, she had the best stories, right? And there were some amazing stories of her life in Africa as an English nurse um, that like, that I cut out that illustrated some of the lessons she was sharing with the main character. Um, I had to cut out a bunch of that. And like Ron, that, that Englishman that he meets, you know, the one who lost his grandson who's drunk every night. Yep. There were originally three whole chapters with him where they walk together and they learn and they go through adventures together. I had to cut that all down and make Ron into just one evening. How did that you know? feel? You know, honestly, as a writer, um, First, it's hard, of course, because you've written such great stuff. Um, but man, when you just whittle it down to only the, the key lessons and still able to pull it off, it's, it feels good. Look, the very beginning was completely different. It starts off in Italy, actually. That all, that's all gone. There's all this amazing dialogue and backstory and all that. It doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> like All this wow. stuff is just, is just gone. You know, like If you're in the first draft, it's a different book. But... By ripping all that out, I was then able to put in also then the layers of key, key things on loving yourself and forgiveness and following your heart, those key lessons. But in a way that they keep on coming back, the themes coming back, the lessons come in different ways. So by the time you're done reading it, you can't help but have absorbed that into yourself. That's what I learned is special about storytelling that nothing else does. You can give someone, a, I, you know, I could write. The key lessons are tenless, tenless bullet point and give them to someone. It's not going to change their life. Mm-hmm. But reading in a story, like, look, kids, when you feel little kids, what, do you read them bullet points at night in bed or do you read them stories? <laughs> if you want to, you know, think about it, right? When I was, before we started the show, I was walking around and I'm going, what's the show going to be like? What's it going to be like? What's it going to be like? And it's not that I like, I heard a booming voice, nothing of the sort, but I heard in my head and I came home and, and, and told Jessica, I said, what I heard is, it's the arc, stupid, <laughs> which is, it's the Joseph Campbell arc. It's the yeah. journey, the human yeah. experience that we can relate to and that we learn from. Yeah. So true. So true. I mean, it's like, 
uh, fundamentally, man, everything, if you look at marketing, if you look at politics, all that, it's just storytelling. Mm-hmm. You know, often storytelling used to um, not necessarily control us, but sway us. Whereas if you can tell human truths that matter, that make someone better through storytelling, what better thing there is? There's no better vehicle. I love it. So on that line, we're going to completely violate the arc, which we talked about in the first part of of the interview. And now we are going to talk about 10 key takeaways. Oh, my God. Bullet point form (laughs) (laughs) to help our kids and ourselves fall asleep at night. Um, (laughs) Love this line from early in the journal from the Gospel of Thomas. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will you save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Yeah, I read that years ago in a book called uh, The Great Work of Your Life by Stephen Cope. Great mm-hmm. book, fantastic book. Uh, it's one of those I recommend everyone to read. Um, and I remember it just floored me. And I went and looked up the, the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. Sure enough, it's there. And yeah. it's like, if you think about it, that... That is fundamentally true, man. Like, look, what I brought for, for example, I love yourself, right? Putting it out there. That, you know, putting that book out gave me so much more than I ever was able to give to it. You know, like, the, like look, we're talking yeah. because you read Love Yourself. Like, all these amazing people come in my life, and it's changed my life. It showed me that my life, you know, and honestly, it showed me my life matters. It showed me that sharing my truth matters, that I have a responsibility now to people, to my readers, to to be better, be a flawed human being who just works himself to be better and the lessons he learns to share them in his own special way, which is for all of us, right? Um, and that is what, now if I had kept it inside me, I don't know what would happen, but I would, I would not be here mm-hmm. this way with, the, with this fundamental truth within myself. And it was only by bringing forth what was within me. And there's so many ways to do it. I don't think everyone, you know, there's a grand thing. Find your purpose and go build a company, all that. You know, whether it's raising a child, whether it's just like being a good person, whatever one's thing is, but just whatever your thing is, bring it forth and then give it to the world. You have to. You have to. Otherwise, I think uh, we live, you know, lives are quite desperation if you don't. I'm very guilty of that. And you probably boomerang back. I do because I've seen what works. Once you see within yourself, once you've experienced it, it's like, you know, like if you bring, if you bring someone who's lived in the cave uh, for all their life, you bring them out, let them see the sun, and put them back in the cave, they can no longer push it. They know the cave, the sun exists, and they will go out again mm-hmm. to find to find the light. It's you know, it's. I think it's very important. Like if we find something that we think is true, just go in and like, just go in, and that's the only way. That's the only way it's going to stick with us. It's like we could read every book on fitness, buy a hundred books, spend an entire year reading them versus go work out. <laughs> go, go see the changes for yourself and then you can never cushion again. I think you also right? said in our first interview, if you want to get outrageously fit, surround yourself with incredibly fit individuals. Yeah, not people trying to be outrageously fit. Always try to surround yourself with people who are already where you want to be. Right? Because you because we have this natural inclination, we're social creatures, man. We're like pack animals that we will like just naturally start to mimic and do the behavior of those around us to fit in, right? We all try to do that, and when we were kids, right? Mm-hmm. But now as adults, why not leverage that? It's subconscious. So like, who if you know, it's like find out what kind of person you want to be, and then find those people already that, and just be with them. Makes sense. Let's go from there to an, another one from the journey. You say, reason will keep you safe, and this, the El Camino, is not safe. What's the importance of not playing it safe? Yeah, I think that, who's saying that? The French character, Louis? I believe so. Maybe possibly so, right? He was a fun one to write. And he's a favorite character for a lot of people, and I was able to share some amazing truths to him through his French, women-loving, <laughs> eating food kind of stuff. It was so much fun to write. I mean, he's actually a homage to someone I met in Camino Santiago, a French guy named Louis who uh, took this young American under his wing and taught him how to, like, open balls of champagne properly and told, you know, had long discussions about women, how wonderful they were. And, like, you know, so this, was, this character was a homage to him. So this thing, um, can you repeat that again for me? Yeah, Absolutely. I, Reason will keep you safe, and this, the El Camino, is not safe. Look, um, 
going doing anything that's out of the ordinary is not safe. That's when our, like, our ego rebels. But that's where growth is. That's where magic is. I'll tell you something like I'm doing recently, coming up on Monday, for mm -hmm. myself. Uh, um, this is my birthday on Monday. And normally, Happy I always early my birthday. Thank you. I normally always spend my birthday alone. And I use the, I created the story like it's a day of self-reflection. It's a day of, you know, like figuring out how I want the next year of my life to be. And you know what? Maybe three times I've done that in my life. The rest is just alone because you know why? It's comfortable. Mm -hmm. And I know where it comes from. It comes from childhood. A lot of this stuff does, right? And in childhood, maybe it was a, it was a safety mechanism. It was a coping mechanism. But I've carried that in adulthood and created a story, a beautiful story around it, and used that to keep myself alone on my birthday. So I asked myself this birthday, what's the opposite of comfortable? So I actually am throwing like a party at my favorite wine bar and I just put it on Facebook. I'm like, whoever wants to come, come. Like, just show up. I, actually, I was going to do it on my um, uh, fan page, too, but then I decided that could get a little crazy for the restaurant. They mm -hmm. only can handle so many. Um, so that one I pulled back. But my Facebook is, public is open. There's a lot of people who follow me there. If they see they come, I, would be, I was like, come by, I'll give you a hug, which is the exact opposite of what I've, what I've done all my life. This is my own personal experiment, N equals one. I'm the only subject, mm -hmm. right? I'm doing it on Monday, and I want to see what it will be like to actually have a birthday where just I'm just inviting everyone just to come and give me uh, so I can give them a hug. Now that's actually uncomfortable. Comfortable, comfortable, safe. Reason says continue what you're doing. Just but now, like you know, be you know, I could tell myself, yeah, but this year, this birthday, I will actually like think of contemplate and think and do all of that. Where, and, you know, I can create that story, and maybe I'll do it, maybe I'm not, but. I have this whole lifetime of that versus mm -hmm. this new thing, which is uncomfortable, which is, but uncomfortable also gets a little exciting, gets a little scary, right? But I bet you there'll be growth there that, that, you know, Monday evening, much more so than if I just continue my pattern, you know? You may be challenging me here as someone who always goes <laughs> quiet on my birthday. <laughs> the gears are turning. But if you think about it, so much of the stuff that we think makes us, you know, this is our thing, our stories we created around stuff we did in childhood, and they were all coping mechanisms. They were yeah. safety mechanisms, right? And if you're not going to challenge them, such China at some point in our lives, when will we? Like when we're death better, 80s, 90s, 100s, whatever we live, or if we're one of the lucky ones, you know, that thinking, oh, I should have done this, or maybe then around a death better, we want to gather, you know, or versus, let me just try it. Worst case, there's always next year, if there's a next year. You know, yeah. I can always go back to <laughs> the routine. So let, let's go from there and talk about, um, and this is something you experience, and, and that's, it's this trial by fire that has, it, which is why that you're able to teach people so well. What's the importance of hitting, quote, bottom? By the way, I don't teach anyone anything, man. I'm not, <laughs> a, I really don't. I, I share what, my own personal journey, my own personal lessons, like, um, I have no desire to teach anyone anything. Mm -hmm. I like to learn from others, you know. But I like, I found that there is, there's something special in sharing your own lessons, you know. And then, now look, bottom, we're also scared of like things going topsy-turvy, hitting bottom. And what I've learned is, and I actually have talked with some very powerful people in this world about this, and they all agree because they've been through their own, like no one achieves their own personal greatness until they've hit bottom. Because it's simple, you can also, it can also destroy you. Uh, but hitting bottom, because you realize, okay, at some point you're like, okay, who am I? What am I going to bet on? Like, you know, like in this, and um, Gone with the Wind, that old classic movie, at the end she goes, you know, has got, you know, she, she's lost, lost everything in the Civil War. She's, you know, like, I don't know, I don't remember it well, but like eating roots or something from the, from the fields. And she goes, as God is my witness, I will never go hungry again. I bet you, if we fast forward, trajectory of our life five years later, she would have a very different place versus... That's what it gives you. I think it gets us deep within ourselves to realize who are we, what we're made of. And then transformation happens. It did for me. Um, and we have multiple bottoms. You know, there's mm -hmm. no like one grand bottom in life. There could be, but I don't think so. You know, we're human beings. We grow. And I think, you know, it says you grow and it could go and it could drip, but then we grow again and dip. So it's never like, I think it's more like this. Stairs yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more like that, or even or, or cones up <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sometimes. But like, 
I don't think we should be scared of it um, because we can use anything we uh, we live. We can use to make ourselves better, which fundamentally makes our life our lives better. You know? along, along those lines, it's a perfect segue. Another beautiful line from the book. One of your characters is, "It's not your wound that makes you special; it's the light that shines through that does." I remember when I wrote that, that's Louis saying, and he says part of it in French, which I, but I remember when I wrote that, I was like, wow, that's good. Because he says that in a piece in English, right? It's just, <laughs> I mean, that, just that, that, yeah, yeah, just that, that piece of dialogue. I was like, damn, that's so good. Um, and, what, and then what's leading up to it, the conversation that's leading up to it, that was one of my best things I think I've written. And um, I fundamentally believe that, man. Like, I, I don't have sympathy. Maybe this is judging or whatever. I don't have sympathy for anyone using their past as an excuse. The past is a whatever it is, you, as a lesson, mm-hmm. right? A lesson of a way to be, a way not to be, and then to do something about it. And that's the light, right? And I've met people who've been through some horrible things, man. And there's some of the kindest, most laughing, most generous people you meet. And I've met to, met people who've been through, eh. And they are miserable and dark and use that as excuse. It's like, no, yeah, human beings, like, look, we live in Western society, when I say or just modern society, we live insanely charmed lives. What our bottom is, is nothing, is the top mm-hmm. for some, a lot of people in this world, you know. And for in human history, my God, we're the pinnacle of what they could have ever hit our average lives, right? And, and yet, like, so it's up to like, but you know, it's like our own personal thing. Our own personal bottom is still our own personal hell. So it's not uh, devaluing it, but it's what do we do with it? Like, who do we choose to be because of it? That's the only thing that matters. You know, I, um, like, look, right now, I'm drinking like this thing of, I'll give you just a blase example. This, this is uh, freshly made beet juice, yep. ginger, yep. fresh turmeric, lemon, cayenne pepper. Why? Um, I started having some issues with my heart about a month ago, a month and a half ago. And I went to a doctor, and he, the primary care doctor, he looked at me seven minutes, he's like, oh my God, I gotta put you all these massive meds, you know, you should be in the ER. And I told him, basically told him to screw off, and I walked out. Uh, you know, never trust your health to a doctor, <laughs> right? And so, did a lot of research, and I changed a lot of things around in my diet, my lifestyle, and so forth. Then I went to see a cardiologist, and you know, we went over the data and he said, okay, you know, yeah, you got to, whatever it is, you got to change these numbers. You know, the, it's, so I changed a lot of things. Normally you'd see me drinking coffee. You're seeing me drinking like a very special cocktail that I make myself now. And you know what? I had just had my new test done yesterday and the car, I always said, my God, what are you doing is working. Awesome. Right. And so what I told, what I actually told him, I, you know, I said, I think this was a gift. This, this was a shot across the bow from life, a gift. Mm-hmm hey, what you're doing is not working and it's going to take you a certain way, right? So my, my choice is, one, I could go on massive medications and still continue that lifestyle, but then there's all these, like, um, um, basically drawbacks of the medication Then you're stuck in a stupid cycle of just medications and medications. Or I thought, what can I do to change my life and be better and to come out of it better? So I completely changed a lot of things. And you know what? My life is better for it. My state of mind is better all of it, and it all came because of that shot across the bow, a gift. You know, I was telling that to someone yesterday. She's like, you're crazy, I mean, you know, calling it a gift. I'm like, well, what's my, what's my choice? If I look at a gift, I can do something about it. If I look at it as a curse, I'm stuck. I'm a victim. It gets to the, my next two questions. You've, you've kind of segued and answered both of them in a sense. The next question is, what's the importance of switching from why me, why now to now what, which is what you're answering, and the importance of saying now that this has happened, what do I do? Yeah, this is something, uh, this actually happened to Camino. I was walking with a, a Episcopal minister from, um, I think it was from South Carolina or North Carolina, a really good guy. And I was talking about the death of my father, and I was trying to understand the suffering. And he was like, you know, and I asked him, why suffering? And he's like, oh, you're asking the age-old question. Like, you know, like, I like to do that. I like to ask, like, really? <laughs> like, how do you find peace? Why suffering? That kind of stuff. Um, and, and he said, okay, you know, he's like, like everyone's been trying to answer this question. It's like, you know, um, I just came, before I came to Camino, I presided over the funeral of a high school student who was killed in a car accident. What do I tell his parents? Like, you can't tell anything to his parents. He's like, 
But maybe instead of asking why, you know, maybe there is no why. Maybe you start asking, now that this has happened, now what? <laughs> now what? I think ultimately that's the only thing we can do in life, man. Now what? You know, um, yeah, why just, like, I mean, if you're going back to what Tim said to me, right? Tim was like, you can't think your way out. If you, if you why, 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 is just a rat hole. And will we ever really find a satisfactory answer? And if we do, then what? Then we'll still go to now what? So why don't just go to the now what? Accept, because we can't change the past, right? And then just like now what? Because that's momentum. That's activation energy. That's action. That's what you were talking about, right? It's just yeah. movement forward. It's a very powerful. One of the things that I have done rebirth is a lot of things I've layered in are very practical. I don't believe, you know, like, you know, I get kind of heady. I like to explore the nature of reality. But like in what I'm sharing, I like, I want to share practical things that one can immediately apply to their lives and be better for it. And that's one of them, actually. Awesome. So from there, what does the cat shuffle have to do with anything? Oh, yeah, yeah. The cat is this amazing character, man. Like, I, the people love her. It took a good chunk of the book. She's in a good chunk of the book. And she's the wise woman who, like, guides him through forgiveness, right? And the cat shuffle was just a way to describe how she walked um, across the Camino. She was older, and she just kind of took the shuffling steps and just, just like, took in everything and enjoyed everything and just shared wise stories. And, you know, they jokingly called it the cat shuffle. From there, what's the importance of loving people? That's a hell of a question. Um, honestly, I think more than the importance is loving yourself. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't love yourself for, if you don't truly love yourself first, first of all, you end up also loving the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, look, you should love everybody, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I know. But look, let's just be practical. Let's just be human. Mm -hmm. First, you got to love yourself. And when you love yourself, you make the choices. If you truly love yourself, you have to be honest with yourself. And when you're honest with yourself, you realize there's only so much time in life, only so many choices, only so many people you can give your energy to. Who are you going to love? Right, so I think it's also important of loving the right people. Um, and you know, I think one of the best. I've wanted to tweet this for the longest time. I think, like, you know, like sometimes saying F off" to someone is the most loving thing you can do for yourself. Because really, not everyone is should be in your life. Not everyone's meant to be in your life. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's like. But that's coming from a place of no, I care about myself more than than what you're doing or what you how you're being. I am more important to me. And when you come from that place, that's mm -hmm. actually when you're better for the world. You know, that's when... Well, you, well, you're saying no to them, but you're saying yes to yourself. Bingo. So I think when... Uh, so I would go back to... Like, look, I get so many emails from readers. Sometimes I get emails asking relationship advice, and I kind of laugh. You know, I'm like, I'm a single guy, man. I'm the wrong guy to ask about that. <laughs> All I can tell you is how to love yourself. You know, and then, then just what naturally arises from mm -hmm. there is your thing. And it's always better that way. Awesome. From there, what does it mean to find our stone? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a guy, painter they meet along the way who actually makes art out of, like, crushed stone. Mm -hmm. That's his thing. And that, that, the amount of work it takes for him to make it. And Pat tells him, like, you know, in his work, he finds everything. He finds God. He finds himself. And she says, we have to find our own stone. And that actually, as I, as I mentioned, I'm like, shit, that's pretty wise. Because... I watched this great TED Talk with uh, Robert Greene the other day, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the 40th Laws of Power and so forth, and the 50th Law. Um, and near the end, he said, you know, like a lot of people are trying to find, make them a personal transformation and make themselves better by, you know, joining all these groups or going to all these seminars or like gonging all these gongs and all this thing. He said, you know, the, ultimately the best way to transform yourself is just your work. You give yourself to your work. And it's so true. It's like because of my writing, I'm better, you know, not from like doing any more than anything else I've done because in my writing, I give everything and I'm better and the world is better because of it. It kind of works that way, right? You find your stone. <laughs> ah, I love it. Love it. <laughs> Holding a stone in my hand. There is love a it. power that comes out of you when you say that, that is not egoic, that is not about me. But when you say it's about my writing, you are 10 times taller and your energy just goes poof. Huh. Yeah, it's like it's the biggest gift I've been given. It's also the 
I've given it the most of out of anything in my life. You know, I I just give everything when I'm writing. When I'm writing a book, I give everything to it. Like there's nothing I don't get right. Um, but man, it's a choice, and it's like, uh, and it's beautiful because when you come out of it, you have something special. And in it, it's personal alchemy, man. If you wanna like, if you wanna transform yourself, really transform yourself, mm-hmm. give yourself to whatever your thing is. Just go all in on it. You know, be it, do it. It is personal alchemy. I love it. So from there, what one homework assignment would you give to people today listening to this show to transform their lives? Okay. Um, you ask good questions, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. A little practice. <laughs> Uh, well, well done. It's working. Um, the one thing that applies across all, the power of personal commitment, not commitment to others. Because mm-hmm. look, you know, one thing I've learned also is like if you make a commitment to someone, the life changes or they change. We don't have to hold those commitments because we are all fluid creatures, but you can be honest about it. But personal commitment, commitment to oneself about something that matters is what is goes along the lines of personal transformation. It's like something that truly matters to yourself, you know, choose that thing. Choose the, the thing, the one that scares you, that really matters to you for yourself, right? Being a certain being a certain way, doing a certain thing, you know, and make yourself a person make yourself a vow. And then go all in. Do it thirty days. It'll, your life, you won't recognize it thirty days later. I huh. swear to you, it's that simple. You will not recognize it. I love it. And you'll keep going past the 30 days and past. You may, and you past. may, you may not. You're, you're human. I fall all the time, man. But then I go back at it. You know? Uh, but it's really, is find your thing and it's commitment to yourself. Not for anybody else. This is your thing. Not, it's not something to do with someone else or be for This is your thing. Right? You got to be selfish in this. Because if you're not better, the world's not better. So if you're not better, the people aren't, you aren't better. So... Uh, you know, it's kind of ironic that way. We always try to give to, uh, you know, the thing, you know, give to others. Well, I'm like, no, give to yourself first. Otherwise, you can't give to others. You won't have anything to give to others. Or you get wiped out. And then how have you served the world? Mm-hmm. You know? And, and you know what? Be prepared to actually lose people in your life. I'm just warning you there. Because when you just start to transform, it shakes. But you know what? It's like Oprah. I, I love Oprah. I'm like this. I would love to just like put my head in a lap someday and have her tell me stories. That's like my fantasy. Like I'm just Oprah telling me stories. Like she talks about how when she started to rise, mm-hmm. people would say to her, who do you think you are? Someone ever says that to you? And she says like those are the people who are removed because they will clasp onto you and bring you down. Their, their sense of reality is to bring, you know, they will be threatened. They will bring you down. Those are the ones. It's like your rocket taking off. You know those things that hold the rocket in place? Yeah. The, right, that originally, like the clamps? Well, what hap- you ever watch the launch videos? What happens to those clamps? They either break loose or are torched. Right? Now imagine if you just kept those clamps there. Where would the rocket go, man? It would explode on the, it would explode the launching pad. Right? So, so, like, be ready for that. But realize the rocket going up is how you serve yourself and serve mm-hmm. the world and serve those you love. Not by being the clamp. So if you're here, so just a word of warning too. We're going all in. You will come across this because you will transform. It's just the way of. I mean, look, Oprah said it. I, you know, <laughs> listen to her. She's way more qualified than I am, right? But I've noticed that. I've noticed that in my life too. And when you start hearing that from someone, no, just their clamp. Your job is just to rise. You're right. You're rising now. Your job is Woo-hoo. to go. Yeah. So, so that's the advice with the warning. You know, there's always a price we pay. There's always a price. But like for some things, the price is so worth it. Even safety and hiding it, it has a price. And that's got the ultimate price, which is ourselves, our real selves. You know, which is a great, which is such a shame. It's a tragedy when we do that. That's why I'm doing this show. That's why I'm sure in large part you're doing what you're doing is the idea of somebody not living, not getting out the music that's inside of them, not existing to their capacity, that saddens me. Yeah, yeah. And look, we all go through phases in life. You know, sometimes I'm rocking it, sometimes I'm not. I've learned to be gentler with myself. Mm-hmm. Um, 
but also like the shot across the bow that life gave me with the with the heart stop. It's also like, hey, you're mortal, buddy. You know, you could be walking around tomorrow and just boom, drop dead. You know, heart stuff is pretty important. <laughs> the heart's a pretty important organ, right? Uh, and just the thing, I mean, I, I, I believe in like love comes from the heart and you know, true guidance comes from the heart. And that's also like, we're here once, mm-hmm. regardless of what you believe, this is the only one I happen to know of for myself. So I'll speak for myself. We got a, it was a shot across the bow. Like you're wasting so much time to be with what matters, be with the ones that matter, do what matters. Awesome. Got a, just a few quick wrap-up questions for you. First mm-hmm. one's going to be a little bit strange for, for um, neither of us have kids at this point, but what advice would you give parents to help their kids live their own lives? Oh, good God. I'd help them break rules for fun. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, like one of the best things you could teach someone is how to break rules. Mm-hmm. Because look, I think anything great I've done in my life was from, from breaking the established set, um, status quo. Look, startups are all about breaking rules. The Silicon Valley is all about breaking rules and like finding like not finding the unconventional way of doing something or the new way of doing something. Whereas this versus a safe way, you know, that's where I I I think that's where true success happens as well as, as a writer too, you know. I could have gone got my MFA, but I was so obsessed with the great writers, I didn't want to go sit in a class with contemporaries and learn from one teacher. I just, I had access to the masters. I taught myself. And so I developed my own style, you know, which I'm really grateful for. I'm, I, I worked very hard on it, but I had the masters to teach me. I had their works, you know, like, um, yeah. And look, self-publishing, love yourself. Right? No publish. If I try to just only work for a publisher, mm-hmm. no publisher would have published. It's too short. Um, the cover, you know, they won't, they won't like, the cover's too honest. Um, but look, now they all, they all want it. But it was because I broke the rules. I could like, with so many things in life, you know, breaking rules. Rules for the sake of rules, I'm such not a fan of. So if I had kids, maybe it's dangerous, but I would actually like playfully show them how to break rules when it does not jive with their, their, moral, their values. I all like you can it. do is give, you know, like teach people values, your kids values, and then Show them how to like walk the chart their own path. Thank you. How to do that? Best of luck. I don't have kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right. From there, and and hop as many fences as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unless there's like you know rabbit dogs on the other side. But... Yeah. Yeah. Run fast. Um, what personally brings you the greatest happiness, or what I call the woohoo factor? When I write something I know is true and good. Honestly. Because, uh, um, yeah, I'm not in a, yeah, like it's not like I'm in a relationship where I can say, you know, that kind of connection or whatever. So I would just tell you what, 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 is, what brings me right now, but what is consistently brought me is when I write something that's true and I know I've said in a way that just pulls it off. Yeah. Awesome. Where can people go to find out more, to find your beautiful book, Rebirth? Thank you. I mean, it's in bookstores. It's in Amazon, Barnes & Noble, all independent bookstores. It's amazing. Some airport bookstores. Or you go to rebirthfable.com and it'll just link to, you know, uh, bookstores online. Uh, but I hope you read it. I, I, I put so much into this book, like so much of myself. I like I give so much. And I, and I think I pulled something special off. And I want the world to experience it. I'd agree. I'd agree. Thank you. Thank you. Any last words of wisdom you want to share with people? Oh, God. Um, I think we all beat ourselves up. Um, I'm very good at it. I think guilt is the most useless emotion we could probably have. Uh, There's only now what? That's it. That works. (laughs) Thank you so much for being on the show, Kamal. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your beautiful book. It is a page burner. You go and you go and you go and you find yourself out on the journey as well. So it is so, so cool. Thank Thank you. you. It's a pleasure. For everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying be well, have fun, get rebirth, and begin following your own heart and shine bright. (laughs) Woohoo! 
dude, you're really evolved. I mean, you were. I mean, our first interview was a, was one of my favorites, and this is just off the charts. Really, really, because you know, I, I get I get asked to do a lot, so I do a decent amount. Like this is one of my absolute favorites. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>